Amen. And uh, why don't you take hold of your Bibles this morning? Just keep playing behind me real softly there. Turn to the book of Acts. How many are ready for something good? I know you didn't wake up for something bad. Come on. The book of Acts. Thank you, worship team. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. Say it like you have power. Power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Father, bless the reading of your word this morning. We love you, and we thank you. And everybody said, give somebody a high five and tell them you look fly. I love it when you see like a 75-year-old person say, you look fly. You're still cool. This morning, I want to take a few minutes of your time to speak to you on a subject that I feel is very important right now where this church is at. Not only where this church is at, but where the, where the body of Christ is at in this time. What does it mean to be a part of a growing church? Uh, there, we, we talked yesterday that there's a difference between being a part of a church that just has activities, that's just busy, versus a church that is producing results. There's a difference between movement and moving forward. Are you hearing me? You can run and you can jog in place and not go anywhere. But when God starts moving the church, it starts to go towards a destination. And that's what's happening in Victory Outreach Santa Rosa. See, the reason why this church is growing, because it's operating under the principle of seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. What is happening is your pastors have said that we are not going to be focused simply on growing Santa Rosa, we're going to be uh, we're going to attack the entire north bay and when we when we begin to when we begin to build listen to me this morning when we begin to build in Yakaya and we begin to build in Coyote Valley and we begin to build in Hopland God is going to supernaturally build in Santa Rosa and so what that is doing is that the growth that is happening in this church the buried treasure hunts that are going on every week are causing us to step into our never-before territory. We're starting to experience things we've never seen. We're doing what we've never done. There's pressure on us to become who we've never been. And all this God is doing to begin to prepare us for this new season of expansion. This is a church right now that is in a ministry that is on the move. Victory outreach around the world. God gave us a promise and said that not only are we in a promised season of expansion, but this year the Lord spoke to me at the end of last year. He said this year is going to be our greatest year of expansion, our greatest year for results, our greatest year for growth for everybody who wants it. Clap your hands if you want to experience growth. But you got to know this today, that when we start to grow as we are, and when we start to break open new territory, the devil's routine is being spoiled. And when the enemy's routine is being spoiled, he begins to go on the prowl, looking and seeking where we are vulnerable. He begins to look upon our weaknesses. He begins to look at those things that we have not shut the door to. He begins to look for those people and, and that are in leadership that really have been looking like they're apart, but they haven't been living like they're apart. He begins to look at the people in the church, and, and, and he's looking to see where can I get in to interrupt their flow because they have interrupted my flow. 
And this is why some of you have been under such great attack. This is why you have been under such great attack in your personal lives. See, you've been going where you've never been. You've been doing what you've never been. You're becoming who you've never been. And all of a sudden, the enemy hits you like you've never been hit. Oh, come on now. Are you hearing me? This is why we've been under attack. And, but the Lord has been allowing the attacks not to hurt you. He's been allowing the attacks not to suffocate you. He's been allowing the attacks not to kill you. But He's been allowing the attacks to build your faith. Because with a great ministry comes the responsibility to have great faith. To be a part of a great church, great faith has to rise. To be a part of a great church, giving has to rise. To be a part of a great church, commitment has to rise. To be a part of a great church, loyalty has to rise. To God, to the ministry, are you hearing me? To man, these are the things that God wants to see developed in our lives. And these are the challenges that we are feeling that are taking place in our life. You know, one of the things you need to know today is no matter what you're being attacked, and I've heard of people getting attacked in their nerves, people getting attacked in their mind, people getting attacked in their marriage, people getting attacked in their finances. I've been hearing it the whole weekend that I've been here, that many of you have been experiencing attacks left and right. You know, some have lost this, and some have lost their families, and some are going through these types of things. You need to know that no matter what the attack looks like, you come out winning. You come out on top. You can't be fooled by the weapon that is forming in front of you. Though the weapon forms, it will not prosper. Though the weapon, you know what sometimes the devil does? I know what it felt like when I lost my, well, well, not when I lost, I'm, excuse me, Pastor James. Pastor James was helping me with something. When the Lord took my wife home, and when my wife graduated into paradise, are you hearing me? When my, when, when my wife went on to be with the Lord, one of the things that happened is that I began to see the weapon formed that the enemy wanted to use against me. I had to wake up to that weapon. I had to go to sleep to that weapon. It's like somebody standing in front of you and you're bound up and you're tied up, you feel like, and they're sharpening a knife. And they're sharpening, and you see the sparks on the blade. And they're telling you, oh, in a few minutes, I'm going to stick this in you. And I'm going to cut your throat, and you're not going to live anymore. Your best days are over. You're, you, you better have enjoyed your life because everything you knew is done. That's what it feels like when the enemy tries to intimidate us. When he tries to stand in our face. See, that's the reason why some of you, your nerves have been getting hit. You've been getting rattled. You've been getting fearful. Fear has been trying to grip you. It's because the enemy is a master at intimidation. But there comes a time when you've got to look. and You've got to begin to see right through that. And you've got to begin to speak to the enemy. And you've got to begin to tell him, even though I'm watching the weapon that you intend to use on me, form in front of me, I'm here to let you know that I serve a God that you may not realize it, devil, but you are not in control. My God is in control. And he did not allow anything into my life that I cannot handle. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You got to tell the devil, oh yeah, when you're under attack, you do a lot of talking to yourself. You may feel crazy, but you may look crazy too. People are going to start seeing you at work. I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. I come against you right now. You better get away from me right now. And all your coworkers are going to say, man, he lost his mind. No, no, no. I'm not losing nothing. I'm winning. I'm winning the fight. I'm battling. I'm fighting for my life. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I feel. You don't know what I'm waking up to. You don't know how it feels to be me. Don't judge me because right now I'm fighting for my life. Are you hearing me? The enemy has a plan. But you know what? I like what Mike Tyson said. When one day they were interviewing Mike Tyson before his fight, 
And they said, you know, Mike, we just came out of the locker room of your opponent, and he told us about the plan that he has to exploit your weaknesses. And he says, man, he goes, it's a good plan. He says, what do you feel? The newscaster said, what do you feel about his plan? And Mike Tyson, you know Mike Tyson, you know, he, he, he looked at the camera, and he says, everybody has a plan until I punch him in the mouth. But he probably said, hey, everybody has a plan before I punch him in the mouth. You know what I'm saying? Right? The devil has a plan, but wait until he gets punched in the mouth by the power of God. I haven't even started preaching my message yet. That's what I want to speak to you about this morning. The power of God. I want to speak to you about the power of God. The Bible says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, uh, when you're looking at the word power in the Greek word, in the Greek translation, it is the word dunamis. It's a word we're very familiar with. But I wanted to speak to you about the dunamis power and give you the breakdown of the dunamis power. The dunamis power has three traits to it. Number one, it has ability. That means that when the power of God falls upon us, it has ability. And what is ability? Ability is the possession of skills. That means that when God's power comes upon you, it comes upon you with the ability to do whatever it is you're being challenged to do skillfully. Are you hearing me? That's why you see young people answer the call of God to get into the music ministry. And they get up here and they get behind the keyboard and they start playing. And all of a sudden they're playing in two years when it took someone else ten years to learn in school. It's because the power of God fell. And when it fell upon, it included the skill to play the keyboard. It includes a skill to own your business. It includes a skill, are you hearing me, to raise your children. It includes a skill to teach. It includes your skill, whatever's needed. The other thing is that dunamis power has is efficiency. It comes upon us with efficiency, which means that we're able to accomplish anything with the least amount of time and effort wasted and it gives us the ability to be successful. So when the power of God comes upon you, it's a guarantee that says you will be successful in what you're about to embark on. Are you hearing me? And the third part of the dunamis power is that it is impressive power with action. That's the word might. It means that it has ability, efficiency, and might but what is might? Might is not just power. It's power that has action, and it also impresses people. So this is what is happening is this, is that the enemy is coming in at times to attack. But God says, I'm coming in with my power, and with my power, is, there's a standard. Everything you're hearing this morning is God's standard. What does the standard mean? That means that when the power of God shows up, it never, ever, ever, ever shows up with anything less than what you heard. Not one piece of it is available. It's all available all the time. So when you come across a sinner that's in the street that's hurting, when all of a sudden you're in the middle of a violent situation, when all of a sudden someone pulls a knife out, that when all of a sudden there's an argument in the house, when all of a sudden you lose your job, when all of a sudden your bills are bigger than your paycheck, and all of a sudden, you know, you come to a place and your body is stricken with disease and you call upon the power of God, the power of God shows up with all that ready for you. Come on, clap your hands this morning. But here's the key. The power of God requires your action. The power of God does not come upon you to sit. The power of God does not come upon you to hear. The power of God does not come upon you 
to feed. The power of God comes upon us, and when it falls upon us, it requires, now step out. Step out. Win a soul. Live for someone else. Build the business. Step out and build your family. Build your marriage. Do this. Do that. See, the problem is, is that not too many people are confident that the power of God will show up for them because they're not showing up for God. Are you hearing me? The reason why some of us have been going through things and we haven't been confident to use the power of God, you know, and let me just tell you, the power of God is not something that just falls upon you. It's something that fell upon us once when we got filled with the Holy Spirit and then it becomes an inherent power, which means it from that point on resides in you. It lives in you. So it's not something that you're waiting for it to fall upon. It's something that when you step out, it comes from, out, from, out, from the inside out. Are you hearing me? See, the reason why some of us are going and we're getting attacked and people have left at times, the, the ministry and different places, and they're going through these things and going through that and this situation and that situation is because when the, the attacks come and when the enemy is trying to intimidate, they're looking for someone else that has the power. They're looking to get to church. They want to get to the altar because this is where the power is at. Or I need to get to church because the power is in here. Or I got to get to my pastor's house because the power is there or I got to get to my leader's house because the power is there because the enemy has convinced you that you have no power but if you've accepted Jesus and you've received the Holy Spirit then the power are you hearing me come on now clap your hands if you believe that you have to step out to see it working in you and through you the dunamis power is what came upon Mary when she received Christ. It's the power at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes upon the children, when He came upon the disciples. The reason why this power is so important is because right now in Isaiah 54, 2 and 3, the Bible says that Victory Outreach, this generation right now that is serving the Lord in our ministry, we are called... Uh, to, yes, continue to reach the treasures out of darkness, but the Bible says that we will inherit desolate cities. Last night, we were in one of those desolate cities. What is a desolate city? A place void of the power of God. A place void of the presence of God. A place where, where when the Lord turns away from something, that thing dies. The eyes of God upon our life is what keeps us living. The eyes of God is what, 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 what keeps us alive and growing. But when the Lord turns away from something, it begins to wither. That's why pride is so deadly. Because when you're going through attacks, a lot of times you don't want no one to know, and then you end up going into recovery mode, and you go into a, a cover-up mode, and then what you end up doing is you end up covering up, and you end up trying to protect an image you don't even have. And that pride rises up, and when that pride sticks around too long, the Bible says that the Lord turns away from the pride. He turns away. He says, okay, I'm going to go ahead and let you do things the way you want to do them because you're not allowing me to work in you. Are you hearing me? And that's where the attacks intensify. That's where the attacks begin to increase. That's when you start to believe that, man, what I'm under and what I'm going through is actually going to kill me. It's actually going to beat me. It's actually going to destroy me. And some people have even gone as far recently to say that, you know what, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to get out of ministry or I'm going to have to uh, get out of this position or I'm going to have to stop doing this and I'm going to have to stop doing that and I'm going to have to stop doing that is because what is happening is, is that the enemy is working overtime to convince you that you are at the end when you are really at the beginning of a brand new chapter. Are you hearing me today? You see, this is the type of power that we need to take into those dead areas like we did last night. 
You see, that was the power of God. That wasn't my words. That wasn't the work of Victory Outreach. That was the power of God where we went into the Hopland Reservation and we were able to extend the invitation of the gospel and every single Pomo Indian responded and came up and gave their life to the Lord. That's the power of God bringing a dead area to life. Give me a little bit more strength here. You see, sometimes there are people who like to live. The reason why some of us are being attacked right now is because you're in a very crucial place in your life. The Lord is stripping some of you away from your comfort zones. And so what is happening is, is that he's stripping you away from what you have drawn security from because he's telling you, that you know what, you've been hanging around in somebody else's field too long. And I am calling you to build a territory that is unbuilt. I'm calling you to do a work that has not been done yet. But what you're doing is that you're saying, no, 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 I, I, I'm not ready to pay this price. I'm not ready to do what God is asking me to do. I don't think I can do it. I don't feel I can do it. I'm fearful of it. So let me go ahead and keep hanging around somebody else's price that they paid to be successful. You need to turn around and tell somebody, stop hiding out in my field. Tell them. See, every one of you today have an intentional there's an intentional plan for your life to see this ministry grow. Every single one of you, God is calling you to new levels this morning. He is calling us to pay the price and begin to go into our untouched, undeveloped, unchartered, unborn territory. That's why it's so important that we prayed for all these business owners because what every one of them were doing was saying, you know what? It would be easier for me to just go get a job. It would be easier for me to work another business. It would be easier for me to work for someone else's success. But I believe that God has put a vision in my heart to give me my own business, to be successful and to be a place that not is dependent on somebody else, but others will be able to be fed what I'm doing. Are you hearing me? See, you can't be afraid of the challenge to step into new territory and let it cripple your faith and let you be overtaken by fear and all you do is stay in your safe zone because when you stay in your safe zone too long, the Lord will allow the enemy to have allow circumstances to come in. He will allow things to take place that will ruin your comfort and your security and then you're left and now what? Are you hearing me? See, my wife graduating into heaven is a part of what I needed to go to my next level. She didn't stop me. She didn't hinder me. But that's one of the benefits of the Lord taking her home is that it had to have an impact in areas of my life that possibly with her, I wasn't allowing God to touch. Are you hearing me? There's certain things that when, you, when your wife is with you and then she's not, all of a sudden God begins to deal with certain areas of your life. All of a sudden you get open. All of a sudden you got to step out more. All of a sudden you feel this and you feel that and you got to step out. And now you got to believe that God can actually take your life to another level without the best part of you. Are you hearing me? We talk about being taken out of your comfort zone. Talk about take, being taken out of your rhythm of life. That's what it feels like when, when you go through the things that I've had to go through. But see, tonight, this is what I want you to ask yourself. I want you to ask yourself, what are you called to do? What are you called to do? What have you been made for? What are the skills that you have? See, sometimes we're more focused on paying the bills than we are about developing our skills. Lord, we come to church, meet my need. Meet my need, meet my need, meet my need. But what about your purpose? The Lord didn't allow us to be born on earth so that we can just go ahead and just get in debt, live a life, get married, divorced, married, divorced. Are you hearing me? Raise kids, 
have the kids mad at us, take off. The, 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 you know, all, and then all of a sudden, here we make a shamble of our life, and now, okay, I made a good mess of my life. Now I need you, God. What do you think? God, God's plan was to have you born. Okay, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you. The word of plans means I'm going to imagine you and I'm going to invent you. You're so special. You're so great. I'm going to cut you out of myself. Then I'm going to command you, go be great. And then you mess everything up. And then in 2014, I'll come into your life and we'll start working on the repair job. No. He said, I formed you. I fashioned you. I created you. I imagined you. I invented you. I cut you out of myself. I commanded you to be great. I named you great. Now I've called you to do a specific task. Are you doing it? Boy, it's quiet. My God. I thought I heard someone's phone vibrate right now. It's so quiet. You see, you can't let your flaws get in the way of your next level. You can't let your mistakes block you from your destiny. You have to learn to do three things when approaching your destiny. Burn your mistakes, have a plan for your flaws, but spend all your time getting better at what you're naturally good at. See, too many of us this morning, you have convinced yourself that the way to get to your next level of life is by improving the worst side of you. You don't get to your next level because you got better at what you're weak at. You get to your next level because you're improving what you're naturally good at. That's a good place to clap. That doesn't excuse us from having a plan for our flaws, but this is what it means. It means that you and I have to realize that some of the things that we struggle with, we will struggle with until Jesus comes. So while you're waiting, now God has come and His power has delivered. He has broken bondages. But there's other things in us all that we have that still linger. And while we await our conquest of those things, God says, while you await to conquer that area, I will give you the power to control that area. How do you control it? Making wise decisions while you battle with it. But don't let it dominate your life and your time. Dedicate your time to still getting better at what you're good at. The challenge in church is that when you come and preach a message like this, you hear too many people that they come to church and their reason for coming to church is to focus on everything that's wrong with them. My family, we need God. Oh, I sinned I sin this week. I'm struggling here. I'm struggling there. I, I, I'm battling this. And my marriage is falling apart. And our finances. And oh, I just lost my job. And oh, my mother died. And oh, they told me I have cancer. And oh, they told me that I have hepatitis. And oh, the, you know, well, we have to move. And oh, I'm losing my house. And we come to church with that. And no one's coming to church to say, oh, you know, I'm so good at this. I need to get better at this. I'm so good at this. I need to get better at that. I'm so good at this. I got to get better at that. I'm so good at this. I need to get better at that. Why? Because we spend all week looking at what we lack. And then when you ask a question like, what are you called to do for God? The room goes silent. Because no one knows. Wow, Pastor Mono, to be honest with you, I haven't thought about that in a while. You should be thinking about that every day. We should be thinking about that all the time. Are you hearing me? That should be on our mind. When I go to sleep, I'm thinking about what I need to do better. When I go to sleep and when I wake up, I'm thinking about, God, i got to do this. Someone comes and tries to talk to me about my flaws from five years ago. Talk to the hand. Talk. No, no, no. Talk, talk, talk to the hand. I can't even have that conversation with you because you're going to talk to me about something I can't change. 
It already happened. I let it go. That was a mistake. I burned it. I light a match to it. I let it go. If you're still holding on to it, I can't do nothing for you. If you still want to remember it, I can't talk to you about it. If you still want to remember it, that's your business. Because me, I had to move on. If I lived where you lived, I wouldn't do anything. I'd still be under the covers crying about my wife dying of cancer. But I had to get up and move out because I had to reach another level. Give Jesus a hand in this place. First Corinthians. Turn there with me. We're going to start coming in for a landing. Are you getting anything out of this? First Corinthians 2.4. After this, I go to Philadelphia, and I have a feeling I'm going to go over there with no voice. Those poor people are going to be mad. Easter Sunday, the preacher's going to come with no voice. And I'm going to blame you guys. Send your hate mail to Victory Outreach Santa Rosa. <laughs> First Corinthians 2.4. It says here, this is Paul talking. He said, my message and my preaching would, were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration, everybody say demonstration, of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. What this world needs is we need Christians that are ready to offer up a demonstration of the power of God at any given time. This world, you know, there's a lot of people. I was just in New Mexico and I was talking to the youth leaders there and I asked them, how are they trying to build their youth ministry? And what they began to tell me was that, oh, we're trying to build our youth ministry through our youth service. And I said, well, how many young people you got? They go, well, we got 15. I said, well, how many are you growing by? They go, well, we get one new young person in every couple of months. And I said, well, how are you going to grow a youth ministry through a youth service when young people in the streets don't even care about coming to church? I said, but they will come to the bowling alley. They will go to the lake. They will go to the mall. They will go to the movies. They will go here. And I said, and it's going to be up to you to stop relying on the, the power of God to show up in the church and start showing up in the bowling alley and start showing up at the lake. And start showing up at the movies. I said, you don't build a youth ministry through a youth service. You build a youth ministry through events that young people congregate at. And you reach them there and then you bring them to your youth service. I said, if you bring a youth ministry, if you try to raise a youth ministry up with a, just a youth service, that's why you only grow by one or two every, every few months. Is because the youth service is only attractive to young people that are really hurting. Not to the masses to get the college student, to get the high school, to get the cheerleader, to get the, you know, and I told him another thing. I said, stop going after ugly people. Go after some good looking people too. <laughs> they said, I don't understand. I said, well, pretty girls attract a lot of guys and pretty girls have pretty friends and handsome guys have handsome friends and handsome guys are attracted to pretty girls and pretty girls. And what happens is you stop going after one and you get 10 or 20 at one time. I said, that's how the mother church grew the youth ministry to 500 young people. We had so many pretty girls and handsome guys there that other churches would come to our youth ministry to look for a wife. And then we tell them, get your hands off. Go, 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 go build your, go find your own wife. Don't come picking off our tree. These women are special. They got a calling. They got a mission. They got a vision. Oh, come on now. That was a good place for the gang girls. But my point is, is that we need to be confident that God's power is going to start showing up when we need it to show up. There needs to be a demonstration. Winning the world for Jesus begins with you winning your world. You winning your world means you winning people around you who are just like you on, in your daily pathway. The word demonstration, listen to what it means. It means that when the demonstration of God's power shows up, it shows up 
And this is what it means. It means it's proof of the power of God. And when it shows up, it points people away from us and onto Christ. So when the power of God, when the demonstration comes, it not only shows that God's power is real and it's alive, but it draws them away from you and instantly they say, wow, God is a powerful God. They don't say you. And if they do, you correct them. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh yeah, every Pomo Indian got saved last night. It had nothing to do with me. That was the power of God. That was the power of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? Here's the, 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 the questions I'm going to give you, and then we're going to end. As they make their way to the keyboard, just the keyboard player. How can you experience the power of God on a daily basis? The Bible says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Our source is the power, and it comes to our actions and efforts of prayer daily, devotion in the Word of God, active worship that's drawn from our love and gratitude to Christ for what He's done, our obedience. We must put in effort to stay connected to the source. Everybody stay still for a minute, please. This is, this is real critical time. We're going to come in for a landing here. Some people like to get out before the, the altar call. Just, I won't make you come to the altar if you don't want to, but just stay put. How do we get the power? How do you remain confident that when you need God to show up, He will show up? Because you got to show up for Him. I like what Denzel Washington said the other day. And Denzel, we were, I was watching an interview with him. And he, he says, you know, they asked him, raised, and he says, well, I was raised the son of a preacher. He said, my daddy was a preacher. And he says, and to be honest with you, he says, I've really been considering stop making movies and come and join my father and become a minister. And he says, and they said, well, tell me something of your upbringing that really stood out to you. And he says, well, this is one of the things that I've learned from my dad. He says that I would, as a little boy, I would walk and I would see my father. And every single night, my dad, before he would get into bed, he would take off his slippers. And then he would get his slippers and he would slide them deep under the, under the bed. And one day, Denzel looks at his dad and he says, dad, why do you do that every night? He says, well, son, every morning when I wake up, I have to put my slippers on. And in order to get them, I have to get on my knees. And I figured while I'm down here getting my slippers, I might as well just start praying to the Lord. He says, so I watched the discipline of my father's prayer life. And it inspired me even as an actor. He says, is that every single day I do my best. He says, I know that I've made movies and there's been, you know, certain things. And he goes, that's just my business. And he goes, and I've had to deal with those types of things. He says, but in my heart, he says, my heart is dedicated to God. He says, and I have learned and I'm learning more and more. And he says, and I, I think that there's a conviction that's starting to happen in my life that's not satisfied with even doing those subtle compromises to make the movies I've made. But the thing is, is that Denzel was describing his personal prayer life. He was describing the prayer life of his father. How's your prayer life today? Are you Christ-centered or are you crisis Christ-centered? Do you speak to him daily or do you speak to him when there's crisis? You open the word so that you will be changed and transformed on a daily basis? Or do we open the Word and we hope that we get what we need because of what we're going through? These are the things when you lift your hands, when you come to church, do you lift your hands in worship? Do you lift your hands in worship out of love and adoration to the Lord? Or does it just happen in church? Or do you do it daily? See, all these things are the things that will, will cause us to be obedient. When you're obedient, obedience is something that needs to be exercised every day. Righteousness is not about perfection, but rather the pursuit of perfection. We must put in the effort to stay connected to the source. The reason why some of us have left, or some of us are left alone, we're, we're left with a lot of desires. You know, this is a question I've been asking people everywhere. 
is at what point do your desires become your results? Are you satisfied with just having a desire to be better? Or are you better? Do you have a desire to see your family saved? And are they getting saved? Or is it just a desire alone? Sometimes we can feel good about just having a desire for improvement, but never see improvement. What's the last win you had? What's the last result you experienced? What's the last answer to prayer? What's the last breakthrough? What's the last evidence that you prayed and you sought God to bring an improvement into your life that you can say, this is the improvement that was brought? Is it five years ago? Is it a year ago? Is it six months ago? Is it 10 years ago? See, when you don't have no recent wins, you start to be vulnerable to, uh, to doubt. We start to be vulnerable to the fear. We start to be vulnerable uh, to those things. And then what you end up doing is that you end up becoming what, what the Bible says is you have a form of godliness, but you're denying the power thereof. You're a shell of power, but it's not flowing through you because it's not being exercised. It's not being a uh, 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 practice. You see, tonight, what we have to make sure is, or this morning is that we're ready to step out. You have to be confident. My goal of preaching this message to you this morning was not to make you feel here. It was to get you to understand that faith, that greater is He that is in us, that the power that you need is living in you. It's not coming from an outside source. It is there. It is waiting. And, 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 and the reason why it's so important for us to step out is because this power requires action. You know, I remember a story about a woman and she was in a flood. And the neighborhood began to get flooded. And it was an older lady. She said, the, the truck came and said, the floodwaters are coming, ma'am. You need to get in the truck. And she looked at the man and she says, no, my God will rescue me. The gentleman asked her again, ma'am, the floodwaters are coming. You need to get in the truck. She said, no, my God will rescue me. The truck took off. The floodwaters came. Forced the woman to the second story of her house. She's sitting in the window. The boat comes driving by. And the man on the speaker says, ma'am, we're sending someone in to get you. The floodwaters are rising. You need to get in the boat. The little lady looked out her window and says, My God will rescue me. Now that flood water began to rise. The boat took off. The woman came. She was sitting on the top of her roof. The flood waters were all the way to the top of her house. The helicopter comes over, drops the rope. Ma'am, grab the rope. The floodwaters are going to drown you. Grab the rope. That little lady, she looks up and she says, my God will rescue me. And the helicopter flew off. The floodwaters rose. That lady drowned. She gets into heaven. She says, God, I don't understand. I waited for you. I told everybody you were going to deliver me. He said, woman, I send a car. I send a boat and a helicopter. You didn't show any action to get in any one of them. That's why you're in heaven. Today, you cannot know the power unless you step out. Can I tell you this? That when you don't step out, this is what the Bible says, Matthew 13, 58. It says that Jesus, this is Jesus talking. Or this is Jesus it's referring to. It says this. And he did not do many miracles there because of a lack of faith. It's saying that the Lord, his power, did not perform miracles because the people lacked faith. Your unbelief is the neutralizer to the dunamis power the enemy will convince you. He will intimidate you. He will bark you back into submission. And what he will do is he will get you to be filled with fear. He's going to get you to feel unbelief. And then when you start not believing, 
Now the power of God has you paralyzed and it does not work through your life because there's no action coming from your life. So ask yourself today, as we all stand, do you feel good this morning? I said, do you feel good this morning? Clap your hands. Stir up a little bit of that power. Stir up a little bit of that excitement. Stir up a little bit of that joy. Stir it up in this place. The word was getting us to reflect this morning, but to remind us that the power of God, it lives in us. If you need to be exercising the power of God, if you need to get rid of some doubt, if you need to get rid of some fear, if you need to get rid of the picture that you've been looking at and you're saying, Pastor, I want to battle the enemy. He's not going to win. The weapon will form, but it will not prosper. I want to fall under the power of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want you to run up here. I want you to get up here. If you need the power, I want you to get up to the altar. Come all over this place. Come. Come, come, come. Oh, come. That's it. Come. Come quickly. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray the power of God. If you're not saved here, come to the altar if you want to get saved. We're going to lead you to the Lord. If you're not, if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, come. If you're at the altar, lift your hands towards heaven. Start calling down that power right now. That's it. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Call down that power. Go ahead, call it down. The Lord, stir the power that's in me. Stir the power that's in me. I need a battle. I need a fight. I need to go after it. I need to go after my next level. I need to, I need to just go after it. Go ahead, go ahead. Keep the lights on, gentlemen. Go after it, go after it, go after it. Go after it. Go ahead. Where do you need success? Where do you need to be built in your life? What do you need to accomplish? What do you need to be conquered? What do you need to be controlled? Get your eyes off of your flaws. Burn those mistakes. 